I'm going to get to that here in a sec. All right, yes? I, I'm going to get to that here in a sec. Um, so on homework four, for those of you that had a deduction on problem three, did you go back and check your fee value? See, remember, uh, it, when, you, when you do a slab design, you're assuming that fee equals 0.9. That's an assumption. You have to go back and check that. Did you go back and check that? That, that, that was the issue. Because fee is dependent upon the strain in the steel, and you don't know what the strain in the steel is at the beginning of the problem because you don't have any steel because it's designed. So that was a mistake that was made by a lot of folks. We didn't do that in examples in class because basically we had done that in previous examples, so it was something we left at the end, but it, it was still something you had to do. So that, that, was, that was it. If you checked fee and you still got a deduction, let me know, and, and that, that's incorrect, and we can, we can check that. But if you didn't go back and check your fee value, that's actually an error, and that, that's a conceptual error, which is why it was there was so much taken off. But all in all, that was really the only mistake. Other than that, everybody else did pretty well. So any other questions? OK, so let's get started. Um, so you all have your homework four back. I'm not going to go through the solution or anything, because A, I already did it, and B, we've already tested on it. So there's not really much point in talking about it in class. Um, don't forget that your homework five is due on Wednesday. Now. Um, we're not going to have class on Monday, so I guess this is sort of like your chance to ask any in-class questions. Does anybody have any questions on homework five? Have you started homework five? I think, did the mic, did you pick that up? There was a, a lot of laughter in the classroom. It, look, it's not that bad, but I advise you to get started on it sooner rather than later. This is not an assignment that you'll want to wait till Tuesday night. It's not like homework three. Like homework three was short, and I, and I think that only took about like 30 minutes to do, so I, you know, I totally understand on that one. But this one's a little bit longer. Now, um, if you recall, we're not going to have class on Monday, um, I, uh, uh, and, and I told you that I was going to post a video to YouTube. It's actually already on my YouTube channel. Um, I haven't added it to the playlist because I was going to add it after this one, but it's on shear analysis. We might talk a little bit about that today depending upon where we get, but um, largely what's talked about in that video is not conceptually that difficult. It's pretty simple, but you really do want to watch it between now and Wednesday. Uh, we're not going to be in class on Monday, so you can, you can obviously watch it then. Um, but when we come back to class on Wednesday, there are some, some very basic stuff in that video I want to make sure that, you, that you're aware of. Because really what the challenge is, is uh, with sheer, sheer design. And we're not going to start that until we get back. But there's a couple things in that video that, that's worth looking at. Um, any other questions? Right. Don't forget the Corps of Engineers Day on Tuesday. And don't forget that the ASHI scholarship application is due in the mail on, uh, on Monday. So if you... Uh, Send it now is, <laughs> is what I would say, um, or or overnight it or something. You know, if if you haven't finished it, uh, everybody good? Okay, all right. Let's get back into what we were discussing last time, which was doubly reinforced beams. Now I want to very quickly go back through some of the uh, mathematical issues, just so everybody's aware. We're going to finish ex uh, example 11a real quick, and then d uh, dive right into 11b. So if you recall, we're, we're dealing with a situation, it's kind of a lot like a true T-beam where we have two couples that we have to add together. We have the couple generated by the, uh, the concrete uh, in compression, and then we have the couple generated by the, um, excuse me, by the compression steel. Now, <laughs> what, what gets challenging with doubly reinforced sections uh, is, is determining whether or not the steel has yielded. Now we've already done an example, or at least you know, partially completed that example, where we learned how to investigate that. You know, we assume it yields, and then we determine an A value, and then we take that A value and, and do a little bit of uh, uh, grunt work to figure out what is the strain in that steel if that is A. And if that's higher than the yield strain, then our assumption is correct and the compression steel has in fact yielded. Today we're going to look at how to compute the capacity, and it's, it's pretty simple. It's not much different uh, than some of our other computations. Um, if the compression steel has yielded, then the force in the steel is just ASFY, or AS prime, I should say, because we're dealing with compression steel. 
If not, then the, the force in that steel is the area times the stress. And the stress is not Fy, it, because we're in that linear range, it's E times the strain. And the strain, we compute as 0.003 C minus D prime over C. So, you know, the expression for the force in the steel is a little more intricate because we're dealing with a situation where the stress can change. Uh, up top, we just have a constant stress of Fy, and on the bottom, we have that linear range of stress, so it's a little more intricate. Now, if we use equilibrium, saying C equals T, add all that together, and then try and isolate our C terms, we get a, a quadratic equation. You know, a pile of junk times C squared plus a pile of junk times C plus or minus you know, a pile of junk equals zero. So we have a, a quadratic equation. If we ever have a situation where the steel, the compression steel does not yield, we have to solve this quadratic equation to determine what is the neutral axis. Where is that neutral axis C such that equilibrium is attained? And the calculation might seem a little mysterious, but once you take that value of C and back calculate what your forces are, you'll see that equilibrium uh, is met uh, uh, and it's all uh, pretty straightforward. So far so good? Okay, so here's the example we were working on last time. Uh, we had two number nines uh, for compression steel and we had four number 11s for tensile steel. Now the beam is 14 inches wide and it's 27 inches tall. Now uh, we have two different D values now because we have two different layers of steel. Our effective depth for the tensile steel, D, is 24 inches and our effective depth for the compression steel, D prime, uh, is two and a half inches. Now what we uh, had done last time is we made an assumption right off the bat, so let me pull up our calculations here. Okay, so last time what we had done is we said, all right, so here's our, our basic analysis and we said the first thing that we'll do is we'll assume the compression steel yields. Everything in that blue box is assuming that the compression steel has yielded. So the force in the concrete is 0.85 FC prime AB. The force in the compression steel is Fy times As prime. And that's got to equal whatever the force in the tensile steel is over here. So take this equation. The only thing we don't know is A. So solve for A. And we get an A value of about 7.14 inches. Now we said, all right, in order to verify that assumption, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that A value. And we'll start off, I'm going to compute C. So C is A over beta 1. That's simple. Comes out to about 8.4. Then I'm going to take that C value. And I'm going to say, okay, if, this, if we assume that the compression steel yields, then what should happen is when we compute the strain in that compressive steel, it should be larger than epsilon sub y. And we found that that was the case. So that assumption was valid. That's, that's going to be a valid assumption for 11a. It's not going to be the case for 11b. And, and so the, the calculation will get a little more intense, but not, not too bad. Um, so this assumption was valid, so now we can sort of move forward. So we compute the strain in the tensile steel for one very simple, re or two really simple reasons. We want to verify that it's larger than 0 0.004, and we want to figure out what our fee value is. Fortunately for us, that fee value was 0.9, so that was easy. Okay, now, all right, equilibrium. I had you do this on this example. It wasn't really necessary for this one, but it's really going to be a valuable check for the next example, so I wanted to get sort of in the habit of it. I wanted to go ahead and just off to the side compute what are my compressive forces, what are my tensile forces. When you add up your tensile forces, there's only one, so you get 375. When you do your compressive forces, you add those up, you also get 375. So this is a valuable check you will want to make to ensure that compression equals tension. If that's wrong, then you've got a calculation error somewhere and you need to go and check that. If C doesn't equal T, you've got a problem somewhere. You have a question? The reason, the reason why, okay, so the, why is this uh, AS prime FY? Yeah. The reason why it's AS prime FY is because this value right here, the strain, is larger than the yield strain. Remember, the yield strain was about 0 0.00207. This is 0 0.00211. So because this is larger, that's times FY. So basically, we've, we've loaded it past where it would yield. So the stress is just FY. If that strain was lower, if it was like 0 .001 or something like that, then this wouldn't be area of steel times Fy. It would be the area of steel times some stress. And we would calculate the stress as E times the strain. And so that strain would be whatever this is. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, sir. That's a great point. So the question was, that's a, that assumes the, 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 the steel behaves the same way in compression that it does in tension. And, that, and that's true. And, and what you're really getting at, if I'm understanding your question, is buckling. Is, is, am I, am I understanding? Well, that, okay, so, so a couple things. From a materials standpoint, steel doesn't really behave that much differently in compression than it does in tension. In other words, its yield stress in tension and its yield, yield stress in compression is largely the same. Same thing as to why it's E, it's Young's modulus, is the same in compression than it is in tension. So, so from a material standpoint, it's not really different. It, it's not like concrete, where concrete behaves much differently in compression than it does in tension. Concrete likes to crack uh, in, in tension, it likes to crush in, in compression. It, it, it's a different story. But that, that's for concrete. Steel, from a material standpoint, really doesn't behave that differently. Now, there is one thing that, that, steel, there, that steel does in compression, and really anything does in compression uh, that's different, and that's buckling. Okay? So things in compression like to buckle. Okay? Like imagine I had a yardstick in my hand. I can take that yardstick and pull on it all day long, and it'll, th there's no way I'd be able to fail that thing in tension. But I can take that yardstick and just do this, and it'll fail after a few pounds because, because of geometric instability, because of the effect of buckling, things in compression can fail under loads a lot smaller than they are in tension. But the difference is with rebar is that rebar is fully encased. Okay, that rebar is fully encased in the beam, so it can't really buckle because for it to be able to buckle, it has to be able to bow out, and there's all this concrete around it, so that that can't happen. Does that make sense? I. Well, I don't think I, I don't get. Uh, I'm. You're right. You're right. We're assuming what's the same. Well, I mean, I'm I'm telling you that that steel, from a material standpoint, does behave behave the same in compression that it does in tension. Rem remember what I said at the very beginning, that normally you can get by designing a beam without having to include reinforcement in the top. So you normally don't need to do that, but you need to be able to assess a doubly reinforced beam for a number of reasons. When you have a beam column in a building that's seeing a large compressive force and it's being bent, you do have uh, uh, this math shows back up. So you need to be able to assess elements, uh, steel elements and compression. Also, and this, this it's going to show up later, but when we look at long-term deflections, compression steel is going to show up again. So you need to be aware of it. But again, from a material standpoint, they behave the same. Okay? That's, I mean, that's just physics. So, yes? Well, AS, well, hold, 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 hold on. You're asking what would you calculate? AS prime by, a, AS prime is just the area. You, well, we're going to do that in the next example. So, so, but what you would do is you basically multiply, instead of FY, it'd be E times the strain. But we're doing that in the next example, so, so, so don't worry. Any questions? All right, okay. Now, we've got these forces, but we haven't yet generated a moment arm, okay? So, tell you what, uh, does everybody have all this? Okay, let me move on to the next panel. Okay, so moment capacity. And we'll call this phi mn, okay? All right, I'm going to be lazy, and I'm going to borrow this, okay? Oh, that's not what I meant to do. That is definitely not what I meant to do. That's what I meant to do. Okay, so remind me, CC was what? 
Like one was like 255, was it? This was 255 kips, and and CS Prime was 120. Okay. All right. What we're going to do is we're going to treat this MoMA capacity calculation a lot like we did the true T-beam calculation. Okay. If you recall, if you have a force couple, so so let's say you've got you know, a force right here. So y'all know what I mean by a force couple, equal and opposite forces, you know, in, in a direction. So let's say this is a force, and this is a force, so it's an equal force, opposite direction, and they're separated by some moment arm, Z, that the moment is just F, Z, right? Make sense? So what I propose is this. Here's the beam, okay? So I've got two compressive forces, right? I got a compressive force generated by the concrete and compression, right? Right? So remind me, this dimension here, this is A, right? So I've got, so that, that's the C sub C, and I also have a force generated by that steel and compression. What I'm going to do is this, okay? In order to determine the moment capacity, okay, I'm going to, this is how I'm going to do this. I'm going to have C sub C times some moment arm plus C sub S prime times some moment arm. And to keep this simple, I'm going to do it the same way I did the true T-beam. I'm going to sum all my moments from here. Because if you recall, for the T-beam, we had, what, the flange couple and then the web couple, and we determined those moment arms from here. Well, let's do the same thing. Let's start off with the concrete force and compression. How far is it from the center of this tensile force? Bless you. How far is it from the center of this tensile force to the center of the block and compression? How do we do that? We got so D minus what? Yeah, D minus half of A. D minus A over 2. So that's exactly what we did before. So D minus A over 2. So if that's how we do this one, how do we do... For, how, what's the moment arm for the compression steel? How far is it from here to there? D minus D prime. So this is how we determine the moment capacity of a doubly reinforced section. Now, let me also make a point. Whether or not the compression steel has yielded or not, that equation holds. That's the same equation because it's just forces and distances. The only thing that would change is what are those forces. But the moment arms are the same. So, plug and chug, we've got 255 kips times 24 inches minus, minus what was A? 7.143 divided by 2 plus 120 kips, 24 minus 2.5 inches. Say it again. So 7176.4, and what are the units on that? Inch kips. Do I have a second on that? I forgot to pass that around. Sign and sheet. I'm getting a little bit of a different number. That's what I, I got, 7789 point like three. Equals, and what's that in foot kips? Sound good? Now what was fee for this? Point 0.9 because the strain in the tensile steel was well above point zero zero or point zero zero five. Yeah. So initially we always when we know the cross section we still assume C equals point 0.9 and then we have to uh, recheck it later. But why don't we just go ahead and solve since we know our D and T values can we not just solve for C from the get go? 
That's a good question. Okay. So, and, and I don't want to get, I don't want to backtrack too far, but let me do this. Let me do this. Okay. I don't want to backtrack too far, but I'll say this. This is from your exam one review slides. And if you recall, I provided two formulas for, for row for design. One was here and one was here. The difference is this is just a guess, complete random educated guess. This is what is what value of row is required in order to achieve a target strain value. Okay? That's what this value is. So if you want, you could design off of this. Here, here's the problem. And and through enough design homeworks, I think I think you'll find this. You can solve for an area of steel and get like 5.526 inches. And then you go and you start picking patterns of steel and you find you can't really find a pattern of steel that's 5.526 either because of bar sizes or, or uh, uh, minimum beam width requirements. There's only so many bars that can only be combined in so many different fashions. So you solve and get like 5.3, but then you end up having to pick something that's like 5.9 or 6 or something. So that's why you sort of have to go back and check because there's a discrepancy between what you solve for and what you really pick in real life. Does that make sense? So you can, but it doesn't change the fact, you can solve for, for that reinforcement ratio, but it doesn't change the fact that you'd have to still go back and check it. That's a good question. All right. Okay, where was I? Oh, going back to this. So um, we had a nominal moment capacity of 649, and what was phi again? 0.9? So phi mn is 0 0.9 times 649, ooh, that's, it's not 69, 649, 649.11 foot kips. So phi mn is what? Okay. Any questions? What do we think? Now again, everything that we've done in this example assumes that the steel yields and then we had a situation where that was in fact true. We're going to find that's not the case on the next example. Okay. But has everybody got this so far? Okay. Now, you're going to look at these two examples, and they're going to look exactly the same. And for the most part, they are, just with a few slight changes. Here's example 11A. Here's example 11B. And really, the only thing that majorly changed between the two is I changed the area of steel and compression. I went from two number nines to two number sevens. And then up here, I used this as four KSI concrete, or I used four KSI concrete for this example as opposed to three KSI concrete. But I think you're going to see it's enough to sort of throw everything in, in disarray. So let's see what happens. Okay. So example 11B. Now, I'm, I'm going to dispense with a lot of the diagrams and whatnot because it's literally the exact same diagrams from the, the previous example. But all I'm going to say is this. We're going to start off assuming the compression steel yields. Now, I told you it's not going to, but, you know, when you start off a problem, you have no idea. You don't have Dr. Mike saying, oh, it's fine, or no, it's not. But before we do, let me go ahead and write some given data, okay, so B for this problem is 14 inches, we have D is 24 inches, we have, um, what do we have, we have uh, D prime is two and a half inches, oh I forgot, I think I changed the, did I change the tensile steel? Okay, all right, good, 5.09, I, I thought I'd, uh, I was sitting here looking at this, I was like, that wasn't right. Okay, so FC prime is 4 KSI. Now, what does that mean for beta 1? 0 0.85 and FY is 60 KSI. 
and then we have an area of steel of 5.09 is that what it is yes. inches squared and area of steel prime is five uh no 1.20 Just so all the relevant info, the system parameters are all in one spot. What? I, I already drew. I already drew it. <laughs> <laughs> I know too much. That's what it is. Here's the thing, so y'all are a lot like the bottom layer of rebar in this problem because I'm sensing a lot of tension. <laughs> that was a good one, and I'm going with it. Okay, back to the problem. So <laughs> 0 0.85 FC prime AB plus area of steel FY equals area of steel FY. Again, we do not know that the compression steel, we don't know whether or not it yields until we check it. So I'm going to assume that, that it does yield. So A is area steel minus area steel prime FY over 0 0.85 FC prime B. Again, these are the exact same formulas we used last time, just solving for A. So we get 5.09 minus 1.20 times 60 KSI and then 0 0.85 times 4 KSI and then times uh, uh, 14 inches. So what does this come out to be? Say it again. 4.900. Zero, zero. Zero, 03 inches. Second on that? All right. And then C is A over beta 1. That is not good. Is 4.903 inches divided by 0 0.85. And what is that? Second. So let's take this and let's compute the strain in the compression steel on the top layer. So that's epsilon sub S prime 0 0.003 C minus D prime over C, which is 0 0.003. 5.769 uh, minus 2.5 inches over 5.769. And what does that come out to be? One seven zero. Okay, do I have a second on that? Okay. That means that our assumption is not correct. It's invalid. Remember, the strain in the uh, steel at yielding is Fy divided by Young's modulus, which is 60 KSI over 29,000, which is about 0 0.00207. So what that means, we assumed that the steel yielded, we're wrong. The steel does not yield. So assumption is invalid.
Okay. So now we got to handle that. All right. Now what I'm going to do is this. Actually, here. I'm going to be really slow. I don't feel like writing all this out. So fortunately, I mean, if the steel does not yield, you have to solve a quadratic equation, but the quadratic equation is already derived. It's not like it's anything that's that complicated. You just got to be careful with how you apply it. So I know this looks nasty, but it's really just a quadratic equation because look at it. You got a pile of junk times C squared plus a pile of junk times C plus another pile of junk equals zero. So how's that any different than AX squared plus BX plus C? Oh, you know, except C is your variable. So what I'm going to do is this, okay? So let's calculate each one of these coefficients, okay? So 0 0.85, FC prime, beta 1, B, okay? All right? So 0 0.85, 4 KSI, times 0 0.85, times B. And what, what's B? 14 inches? What does that come out to be? Forty point four six. Is there a second on that? Okay. Before we move on, how many feel like that I pulled this equation from space? Okay. What's that? Uh, okay. Uh, okay. No, 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 no. All right, all right, all right, all right. Before we go, uh, we're we'll gonna take a second. Is everybody okay with this? Is everybody okay with this? Okay. Watch this. Here's where this is coming from. Okay. Look at this equation. This is C sub C. Right? This is C sub S prime. This is T sub S. Is everybody okay with this? Everybody all right with this? If you're not, please. I mean, this is the time. Okay. Now watch what I'm going to do. Watch this. I'm going to multiply both sides by C. Okay. The reason why I'm going to do that is over here on the left, I'm going to get 0 0.85 FC prime beta 1. What's going to happen here? C squared. So I'm going to put B, and I'm going to put C squared out here. Everybody okay with that? Plus AS prime ES 0 0.003 C minus D prime. And over here, AS FY times C. Is everybody okay with that? All I'm doing is just taking this, putting all the C squared stuff together, the C stuff together and the constant stuff together. So I, I don't want you to think that this equation just sort of sewed up from space. It's just C equals T and isolating the one thing I don't know. Is, is everybody okay with this? So from here to here, it's literally just algebra. So look, look what I have here. See the C squared term? That's this. It's the same thing. How do I get the C term? Well, I've got this and this. See what happened? I just subtract and factor. That was it. Is everybody okay with this? Okay. And please, if you ever, I mean, if this stuff is, if you have any questions, I mean, this is the time to ask, because I saw, I looked on everybody's face, and they're like, uh, you just sort of, 
What, this term right here? Yeah. Okay. So let's expand. So 0 0.85 FC prime beta 1 B C squared. This right here takes some foiling. AS or foiling or factoring out. Epsilon sub S 0 0.003 C minus AS prime ES 0 0.003 D or D prime. Everybody seeing this? Then subtract minus ASFY C equals zero. Is everybody okay with this? Not so bad, right? It, it's I know the formula looks long, but that's all it is. It's just long. It's not hard. It's just long. Any questions? All right. Let's go back to this. Again, th this is this is the time. If you got questions, this is time to ask. All right. So let's go ahead and calculate this out. So the next one, AS prime ES 0 0.003 minus AS FY. And I'm not going to worry so much about units at the end because everything's going to be consistent. So AS prime is 1.2 inches squared. This is 29,000 KSI. This is 0 0.003 minus 6 and 60 KSI. What does that come out to be? Is it, oh, no, that's wrong. I'm thinking of the previous example. 5.09. Thank you. Negative 201.0 or even? Negative 201. That's fine. Look, we're just solving for constants in a quadratic equation. They can be positive, they can be negative, they can be whatever. That's fine. So now, look at this. Quadratic equations like, you know, ax squared plus bx plus c. See this minus right here? See this? Don't forget that, okay? What I like to do is this. I put the minus right here. So minus as prime es 0.003 d prime. Put the minus there, okay? So minus 1.2 inches squared, 29,000 KSI, 0.003 d prime is, I'm sorry, two and a half inches. Minus 261, okay. So, seems like there's a lot going on here, so why don't I do this? So, we got this number, this number, that number, right? But how about this? There's your equation, right? Everybody in here with the Casio FX115 ES Plus should be able to solve that like that, right? All right, what, what I was getting, uh, that's a great question. So units, okay? If you are really diligent and follow it through, you will find that the units are consistent. But I'll say a couple things. Number one, everything's in kips and inches, everything. So we're good there. If you really track it out, this one is kips per inch, but it's multiplied by inches squared, all right? This one is kips, but it's multiplied by inches. This one is inch kips, but it's multiplied by nothing. So it all works out in the end, but that's why, I mean, as long as everything's in kips and inches, I just don't bother because it doesn't really matter. So. so if this is a quadratic equation, that means there's two answers, right? So tell me what you get. You should get, so say that again. Right? So which one doesn't make any sense? The negative one. So because it doesn't make sense for your neutral axis, that'd be above the beam. It wouldn't make any sense. So uh, your neutral, so do me a favor. Let's do, let's do one more decimal place. What was this one? Okay, let's do this one. Okay, so therefore, 
we're going to take C to be 6.037 inches. Okay? All right. Do you remember that whole equilibrium check we did in the last problem? Let's do that again. Okay? And let's see what we get. Can, uh, can I go on to the next panel or is everybody good? All right. Now, so let's check this. So let's look at equilibrium. All right. What is C sub C? It's 25 FC prime. Now, now how do I compute that? Tell, tell me what to write. How do, you, how do you compute the compressive force in concrete? 0.85 FC prime times what? I'm asking you. Yeah. Oh. It's 0.85 FC prime AB, right? Uh-huh. Now, now, what's A, though? I'm lazy is what it is. No, 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 no. A is beta 1 C, right? We have a new C. They, see that right there. That is a mistake that you are going to make on a homework like this. You're going to use the A from before. I've seen that mistake happen more often than, than, than I would like. So you're using the new one, okay? That's what I'm going to do. So beta 1 C B. So I'm actually, I'm going to do that. That's exactly what I'm going to do. In fact, I actually like you to do this because I think it, I think for some reason psychologically it reduces the chance of you using your old A, you know. So plug and chug, you get 0 0.85 times 4 KSI times uh, beta 1, 0 0.85 times C. And what was C again? 6 point. And then B is 14 inches. All right. Now, don't forget, there's some rounding here. You know, we rounded it. I, I wanted you to carry it out a few decimal places so we reduce our error. But let's just see what we get. What do we get here? Two. Do I have a second on that? You've been overruled. All right, now watch this, okay? Let's write this out. Is that right? No. No. It's whatever the stress is, which is times E times whatever the strain is, which is... which is that. Did I go too fast or is everybody okay with that? Right? Because this is that. And the strain is that. Is everybody okay with this? We can't use that one because the C changes. Exact right here. These are the discussion points I want to have. We can't use that epsilon sub s because it's a different. It's a different C. Man, I'm, I'm glad somebody asked that. All right. So, 1.20 inches squared. 29,000 KSI. 0.003. 6.037 inches minus 2.5 inches over 6.037 inches. What does that give us? Say it again. Do I have a second on that?
All right. So just help me out here. What's that? You've got a calculator and Is there a second? <laughs> you said 305.43. Is there a second? He said 426. Now, what's the tensile force? ASFY. Well, 426, that is 43, so. Okay. Now, this is 5.09 inches squared times 60 KSI. And what is this? Oh. 305.4. Now, take a look at this, okay? This is the total compressive force. This is the total tensile force. They equal one another, minus some rounding, okay? If we were doing this like an Excel and tracking all our decimals, it'd be accurate exactly. I highly recommend that you do this on these problems because you want to make sure that the C that you're using makes sense. If you don't get that, you did something wrong. That's a great question. Um, the answer is yes. Okay. Two things. One, uh, hold on. We're, everybody's packing up. We got, we got some time. All right. Number one, we are always assuming that the tensile steel yields, but then again, it's not really so much of an assumption because remember, we have to meet this requirement. Right? You're right. You're right. We didn't check that. So in order to check that, what we've got to do is we actually have to go and check it. Okay. We actually have to go and do this. We have to compute the strain in the steel, but we have to do that for another reason. We still have to compute phi, right? And, and phi is dependent upon that strain. So, so what I'm getting at is we're not done. So, all right. So, while we're here, all, everybody, we almost, we got some time. You're getting off class on Monday. You, you can hang out for a second. Our nominal moment capacity is C sub C, D minus A over two, plus C sub S prime, D minus D prime. Now watch what I'm going to do. Watch this. See that? I'm replacing A with beta 1 C. So what is that? 244.26 kips times uh, 24. Is it 24 inches? 24 inches uh, minus 0 0.85, 6.037 inches over 2 plus 61.17 kips, 24 inches minus 2.5 inches. What does that come out to be? Second? Yep. Okay, and divided by 12. 1245.89. Sound good? Okay. One final calculation. Hold on. We're almost done. I know. What is this? Hold on. Say it again. Point zero zero eight nine three. 
Okay. So, does the steel yield? Potentile steel? Oh, yes. Do we meet our .004 requirement? And we're over .005, so phi is 0 0.9, and what is phi MN? 291. I'll take your word on it for it. <laughs> Any questions? All right. You should be good to do your last problem on the homework now. All right. I got 24 cupcakes up here, and nobody's touched it. Please. What am I going to do with 24 cupcakes? That's a lot of cupcakes. <laughs> 